All right, it's good to see everyone here. As always, if you're visiting with us, we're glad you're here. Uh, Revelation chapter 22 is our text, and we will finish our study of the book of Revelation this evening. I uh, hope it's been a good study for you. I always uh, enjoy the book of Revelation, although I think uh, some of you have told me it wasn't what you expected. I don't know if that's a compliment or not, uh, but uh, I hope that uh, maybe you have learned something from the book and uh, found something useful as well. Uh, I can think of no better way than to spend uh, this evening than thinking about the glories of heaven as we look at Revelation chapter 22. Uh, you recall that uh, in chapter 21 that we had a vision of the New Jerusalem, and it is a New Jerusalem, it is a city, it is a bride, uh, and all of those prophecies about God taking away the veil that stretches over the nations, taking away death, uh, John says this is where all of those will find their ultimate consummation. Uh, and then we looked a little bit at the uh, description of the city, and we noted its perfection, its beauty, and the dimensions of the city are rather interesting in verse 16, that the length and the width and the height are all equal, suggesting that this is the holy place. Remember, we said that there was one other thing described in the Bible that is a perfect cube in its dimensions, and that it was the most holy place in the tabernacle and then later the temple. Well, that's what this is, and it's not as the Hebrew writer would say, a copy of the things that are in heaven, but this is heaven itself. Heaven itself is the dwelling place of God, and it is the real most holy place. And to that end, we noted in verse 22 that there is no temple in this city. Normally, an ancient city would have a wall, it would have streets and houses, but it would have a temple in the middle of it where God or their God lived. But this city is the temple. Uh, this place is the presence of God. It says in verse 22 that the Lord and the Lamb are its temple. And remember uh, what was going on with the temple in the Old Testament, that God was in the temple, but you couldn't be there. The high priest could go into the most holy place once a year, and that's as close as anybody got to the presence of God but this is no separation here. As John had said in verse 1, the sea is no more. Nothing is separating us from God here in heaven, and we are now in the presence of God himself, not at a place where we can get closer, but in the presence of God himself. Uh, and it is a place that is perfectly secure because God has eliminated all of God, uh, the enemies of God's people, and so the gates will never be closed and there is no threat of any kind of uh, unbeliever causing any kind of hardship or anything like that because all of those who have been unfaithful have been excluded from this place. Uh, so with that in mind, let's go to chapter 22. And uh, remember, uh, there's a lot of things that John is kind of throwing together here. We've got the temple, the Jerusalem, covenant, new Israel, new creation, all of those threads in the Old Testament are coming together in this text here uh, and finding their fulfillment. Uh, we have in the first five verses uh, the finishing of the, the description of the New Jerusalem. The chapter division is kind of unfortunate in a lot of places in our Bible, and here's one of them. Uh, but then in verses 6 through 21, we have an epilogue or a conclusion to the book, and uh, there is a great emphasis in those last 15 verses about the obedience of God's people. About half of those verses have something to say about being faithful uh, in light of what is about to happen. Uh, so let's look at the first five verses, uh, continuing our understanding of the heavenly city. In verse 1, he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb in the middle of its street. Uh, if you've ever read the book of Ezekiel, you remember in chapters 40 through 47 or 48, uh, there is this description of an ideal temple. It's not a temple that ever existed, but it is a description of the messianic age, as it were, in the form of a temple. And one of the most beautiful pictures, I think, in all of the Old Testament is in that description. Uh, Ezekiel says that coming down from the steps of the temple 
was a small little trickle of water. And it flowed down the steps and outside the gate. And as it got to the gate, the water was a not just a trickle, but it was a stream. And as it got out to about the Kidron Valley, it was ankle deep. And the farther this river flows, the deeper it got until it became a flood that flooded the entire southern end of Palestine, which is all desert, nothing growing there, and it all came to life. Uh, John is picking up on that beautiful picture here, that out of the presence of God is coming the source of life. Uh, remember there's a difference in the Bible between a sea and a river. A sea is usually a, a, an image and a symbol of that which is threatening and destructive and dangerous. But a river is a source of life. And so John had told us in verse 1 of chapter 21 that the sea is no more, no more danger here, but there is the river of life coming from God himself. Uh, several passages in the Bible refer to this kind of thing. Uh, Jeremiah 2.13, God is called the fountain of living waters. Why have you dug for yourself cisterns that can hold no water, and you have ignored and refused the fountain of living waters? Uh, in Psalm 38, they drink their fill of the abundance of your house and give them to drink of the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life, in your light we see light. And so this idea that God is the source of life for his people. And remember what Jesus said to the woman in John chapter 4, that if you drink of the water that I would give of you, then you would never be thirsty again and you would live forever. Uh, Jesus, God speaking the same kind of language there, that they are the source of our life. And uh, it is a very beautiful picture that here we are in heaven, in the presence of God, and the source of life is there for us. And of course, uh, the Garden of Eden was like this. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 10, Moses tells us that a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it divided and became four rivers. Uh, the, the well-watered nature of the Garden of Eden is emphasized in Genesis, and that's the picture that John wants us to kind of go back to here. Uh, there is no death, there is no want, there is no thirst or any kind of, of lacking of anything that we need. That God is there to supply us with it all. Uh, so right down the center of uh, the street of heaven is this river of the water of life. On either side of the river was the tree of life. And very often people have asked, how can that be? How can a tree grow on both sides of the river at the same time? Uh, well, it's either just poetic language or we're supposed to think of not just a single tree but an entire grove of trees uh, lining both sides of the river. Either one of those uh, would be the picture, but remember that this is taking up uh, the idea of the Garden of Eden. And in the biblical way of thinking, a garden is not where flowers grow. A garden is where trees grow. And so if this is Eden again, and it certainly looks like that, uh, this tree might not just be one single tree, but the trees uh, all over. Uh, that's just a possibility. Uh, the last time we saw the tree of life was where, obviously? In Genesis, yeah, when it was in the Garden of Eden. And the picture here is that God is finally going to have that fellowship with man that he has always wanted. God made this beautiful place in Eden because he wanted to enjoy his fellowship with man. Man had other ideas, though. Adam said, I'm, I'm going to go do something else. God, thanks for the life. I'm going to go live my own way. And God had to remove him from Eden and from the tree of life because it was not God's plan for this sinful, rebellious creature to partake of eternal life. Uh, but here in heaven, there are no more people like that. As we saw in the last verse of the previous chapter, there is no one who practices abomination or lying and uncleanness. Those people are all gone. God finally gets the kind of people that he wants, and they can live forever in his presence. And the tree of life, we are told, also bears fruit. Uh, we get this uh, same kind of thing in Genesis. 
that uh, there is the uh, the tree of life in the midst of the garden, and here again man has access to it, and Ezekiel 47 in that picture of the temple that Ezekiel saw there, by the river on its bank on one side and on the other will grow all kinds of trees for food. And so you see it might not be just one tree, but could be several. Their leaves will not wither, their fruit will not fail. They will bear every month because their water flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for healing. Healing, of course, is a way of talking about restoration in the Bible, the things getting back to the way they're supposed to be. And so here in heaven, this is the way it's supposed to be. This is our life as God originally designed it. The life that we live now, separated him by, from him by sin and death, is not God's plan. This is what God always wanted for us. Uh, notice here that uh, just like the tree in Ezekiel 47, that the tree of life in heaven bears its fruit every month. So there is no waiting. There is no time of plenty followed by a time of scarcity. Uh, it's always in season. There's always fruit growing on it, and so there is never any lack. Just like it was uh, uh, in Eden. Remember, God had this garden where everything was just growing and Adam didn't have to work hard. Well, that's the idea here as well. There's not going to be any sweating for the uh, food that we eat. God provides it fully. Um, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, just as we have from Ezekiel. So uh, everything as, as it is supposed to be here in heaven. Verse 3, there will no longer be any curse. Uh, this, again, like everything else in the book, is an Old Testament theme in Zechariah 14 and 11. Uh, God speaks of the land. Remember, Zechariah is one of those prophets that speaks in the time of the restoration after the captivity. Uh, lots of rich messianic prophecies in that book as the return from captivity foreshadows the messianic age. And in one of those brilliant messianic uh, visions, uh, the statement is made that people will live in it, that is, in the land and there will no longer be a curse, for Jerusalem will dwell in security. And so, um, no longer be a curse. Remember that the Jerusalem on earth had been a curse of God because of the people there and their faithlessness, and the city was destroyed because of that. But nothing like that will ever be here because there is no curse in this place. Nobody is to be cursed uh, and uh, there will no longer be any curse, might even be a reference back to Eden. I remember what God said to uh, Adam, cursed is the ground on account of you. But this ground is not cursed. Uh, this is just plenty and life-giving all the time. And uh, the word curse, interestingly, can also denote what has been banned in war. Uh, remember in the story of Jericho that the entire city was put under the ban because the first of everything belonged to God. Um, the enemy was devoted to the destruction, uh, to destruction for God. That same word is the word that's used here, and so it could also mean that there is not going to be any more enemy, that there is no more opposition, no more threatening, no more persecution. Uh, it could mean any of those things or all of those things. It's just kind of a generic statement. But the picture is one, again, of perfection. Nothing that is wrong with this place. And the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his bond servants will serve him. Uh, they will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. Uh, the phrase that uh, is used here it says that his bond servants will serve him. Uh, that is the word in the Greek language that is normally used of the work of priests. And so, again, there's a lot of imagery that is mixed here. We've got priests, but in front of the throne of God. And that was the imagery of the tabernacle in the temple. Remember that the 
Ark of the Covenant was the footstool of God. God says in Isaiah that earth is my footstool, heaven is my throne. And so the idea was that when the priest went into the most holy place, he was at the feet of God and poured the blood and sprinkled the blood at God's feet. Well, that's the picture here as well, that God's throne is there and his people, all of them are priests serving God. Now, we're not told what kind of service that they render. Uh, presumably it's not sacrifices for sin because all of that is done away with. But they are close to God in the way that the priests were close doing whatever it is that God has them do there. Uh, and it says in verse 4 that they will see his face, which is, of course, absolutely unprecedented in all of the Bible. Uh, John 1.18, no one has seen God at any time. The only person who has ever seen God in the face is Jesus. John 6.46, not that anyone has seen the Father, but Jesus alone, because he has been with the Father. And then Paul says in 1 Timothy 6.15, that he is uh, the blessed and only sovereign, King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in inapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see. No living mortal man has or can see. Now there are a couple places in the Old Testament that talk about people seeing God, but when we look at those passages very clearly, uh, and carefully, it is obvious that they did not see God face to face, that they saw some manifestation of his glory, they saw something that looked like fire, but they did not see God in the face. But there is this persistent hope in the Old Testament that we will be able to see him. And that really is the hope of all righteous people of all time that if we could just be with our Father, things would be okay. And to go home and to be with Him and see His face would make everything right. He will pray to God, Job said, and He will accept Him that He may see His face with joy and may restore His righteousness to man. In Isaiah 40, in that great passage about God bringing His people home to Him, again, Ultimate, first about the, uh, the Babylonian captivity, but ultimately about the exodus from sin and God bringing his people to heaven. The glory of the Lord will be revealed, Isaiah said, and all flesh will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. But perhaps even more than that, 1 John 3, we are children of God. It is not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. And so we will see the Lord, we will see God, both of them in their glory, their full splendor on their throne, and uh, we'll be in a position, in, a, in an existence, in a mode of existence, where we can do that and live. And so, you know, that's the kind of thing that always puzzles us. What's that body going to be like? What's it going to be like to inhabit that spiritual body? Well, the Bible doesn't try even to describe that. Uh, it just says that this is what we're going to be able to do. It says in verse 4 that not only will they see his face, but his name will be on their foreheads. We've seen this a couple times in the book. Uh, we saw that those that had the mark of the beast were marked on their foreheads, and in a similar way, in the very next chapter, chapter 14, God marked those who belong to him on their foreheads. Now remember, this is not literal, uh, so don't go looking through your scalp for some barcode or something like that, you know. Uh, it is an image that God knows who his people are. He is mindful of them, and he is going to protect them because he knows them personally. He's marked them as belonging to him. Well, here we have that in uh, heaven as well, that God's own people, not anybody else, just them are in this place, the people that belong there who belong to God. And so what a, a wonderful picture it is. And the last part in verse 5 is that there will no longer be any night 
They will have no need of the light of a lamp, nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. And again, this is a biblical picture of God, that he is, his, his presence is light. Paul talked in the verse we just noted a moment ago about God who dwells in unapproachable light. In Daniel 2, it is he who reveals the profound and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. Not that he dwells in light, it dwells in him. He is the source of it all. You think about that in Genesis chapter 1. The very first thing that comes out of God's mouth is, let there be light. Uh, John goes on to say in John chapter 1 that light is life. Jesus is the light and the life, light was the life of men. This idea of light as being necessary for life is here in Revelation 22 as well. We've got water, we've got food, we've got light. The water never stops, the food never runs out, the light never goes off. Nothing that is a symbol of hardship or death has any place in this description. It is all nothing but the fullest kind of life that is possible. And it is in this condition that the saints, God's people, will reign forever and ever. Again, there are hints of this in other places. Daniel 7 uh, the sovereignty, dominion, and greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. His kingdom will be an everlasting one. And then in 2 Timothy 2.12, if we endure, we will reign with him. Now remember the people to whom Revelation was written. People who were about to undergo a terrible ordeal of persecution. And John writes to tell them, this is how it's going to go. This is the source of your opposition. You need to make up your mind to be faithful. And if you will, it's not just that God's going to rescue you, that you will reign with God and with Jesus. This idea that you'll be the winner in the end, you'll be the victorious one, is the picture that is painted here as well. Uh, let's move on. Let's go to uh, verses 6 and 7. He said to me, these words are faithful and true, and the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. And so this is very common in this kind of literature that we have a guarantee that this is a truthful message. Uh, this is kind of a uh, certification, as it were, of everything. And in verse 7, behold, I am coming quickly. Remember the book started that way, uh, chapter 1, Behold, I am coming on the clouds. Uh, and we said that that is not the end of the world, the second coming uh, at the judgment day, that that is typical apocalyptic language for when God comes to destroy a wicked city or a wicked nation. Well, that's the sense of it here as well. Uh, I'm coming in the sense that I'm going to come and destroy your enemy. He has told us in this book about the enemy they were going to face and how fierce it was, but over and over again, he has said, but this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to destroy it. It's going to be gone before you know it. And so here we have the promise that this is going to happen very soon, and I'm going to, take, I'm going to do what I said. Uh, the words, blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy, is the message of faithfulness. This constant thing that we've seen throughout the book, that you must not be among those who dwell on the earth. You must not give in to this great enemy, but if you'll maintain your faithfulness uh, then and heed what this book says morally, uh, then you will be blessed as well. I, John, verse 8, uh, we have kind of John's signature, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard it and saw it, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed me these things, and he said, don't do that, I'm a fellow servant of yours. This is the second time in the book that we've seen this. Uh, chapter 19, we saw it. And uh, I'll just admit, I I'm not sure uh, why this is in there. Uh, does it have something to do with emperor worship? Uh, does it have something to do with the religious climate of John's day? I, I kind of think that it probably does. Um, in the Hellenistic world of the first century, especially in Asia Minor, uh, people were very 
anxious to have some kind of contact with the divine. And they believed in angels, and they believed in intermediary beings. And some people, like sorcerers, actually believed that they could talk to these angels and other beings. And so was there something among John's readers that maybe thought that they could get in touch with angels, and if they worship the angels, that the angels would take care of them? You know, I don't know, but it wouldn't surprise me if something like that is behind all of this. Uh, but it is very clear here that uh, God is to be worshipped, the Lord is to be worshipped, and not the angels. And so whatever the tendencies were in John's day, he is here correcting them. He said to me in verse 10, don't seal up the words of the prophecy of this book. Uh, in Daniel, Daniel chapter 8, Daniel receives a vision and he is told to seal it up because the vision is for many days from now. And so the idea that we saw in chapter uh, 4 and 5, that there is a scroll that is sealed up, and when it is opened, the things written in it happen. Well, John has told his readers, this is what is in your very near future, and now he is told, don't seal it up. This is not for something 2,000 years from now, John said. It's for something that is going to take place very, very soon. It is the time is near, John said. Now, just to say, um, you know, very often you hear, well, what is near to God, right? A day is like a thousand years, thousand years like a day. Well, if we're going to quote that passage every time we come to a, a passage that talks about near or far or long or short, uh, none of this means anything. Uh, it has to mean something. It, I do get the impression that God knows what near and far is, and that when he says that the time is near, he does not mean 3,000 years from now, that he means that this is something that you and, and your generation are going to experience. That, that's how the early Christians would have understood this passage. And so it's not for the far future, but within uh, their own experience. Um, then we get a strange kind of uh, statement in verse 11. The one who does wrong, let him still do wrong. The one who is filthy, let him still be filthy. Let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness. The one who is holy still keep himself holy. Uh, we actually get a lot of language like that in the Bible in Ezekiel 3. When I speak to you, I'll open your mouth and you will say, thus says the Lord, he who hears, let him hear, and he who refuses, let him refuse, for they are a rebellious house. Uh, Daniel 12, many will be purged, purified, and refined, but the wicked will act wickedly. None of the wicked will understand. Jeremiah 44, as for you and your wives, you've spoken with your mouths, fulfilled it with your hands, saying, we will certainly perform our vows that we have vowed. And God says, go ahead, confirm your vows, and certainly perform your vows. Uh, the picture is God saying, this is the truth. This is what's going to happen. I'm going to destroy this enemy of God's people, and I'm going to destroy all the people that have cooperated with it and bowed down and worshipped it and participated in it and supported it in any way. They're all going to be destroyed. Now, you can believe it or you won't. Uh, you can listen to me or you can refuse. The choice is yours. That's the point of this statement. You don't want to do this? You want to do wrong? Go ahead, do wrong. The choice is yours. Uh, you want to be filthy? You want to be defiled? You want to engage in all this stuff? Fine, go ahead, see where it gets you. But the truth has been laid out. The warning has been given, and so you make up your mind. Uh, Ezekiel 20, as for you of house of Israel, uh, says the Lord, go, serve everyone as idols. Hey, you want to worship idols? Go ahead. Fine. See what it gets you. But later you will listen to me, and my holy name you will profane no longer. After I get done punishing you, uh, Isaiah 6, go tell this people, Keep on listening, but don't perceive. Keep on looking, but don't understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive and their ears dull and their eyes dim. You know, God's, you know, God's not going to fight with you. You want to take all this warning and ignore it? Fine. But you've been warned. And if you want to take it seriously and practice righteousness and be holy, 
then do that. The choice is yours. And it's an ironic kind of sarcastic thing that God says uh, in, the, uh, in the midst of these kinds of texts and trials. Um, but to that end, he says in verse 12, that you need to know that I am going to be coming quickly and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. So if you want to do wrong, go ahead, but I'm going to recompense. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. We saw that at the beginning of the book and here at the end as well, uh, that he is omnipotent. He is in control of it all. Don't let anybody think that they're going to escape from the scrutiny of this great Lord. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter by the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons, the, that is, fornicators, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices lying. Uh, like we said in chapter 21, those may all be descriptions of people who compromised with the emperor cult. Uh, dogs, of course, to the Jewish way of thinking, are are not pets. They are dirty, filthy animals. Dogs in ancient times were scavengers. They hung around graveyards and garbage piles. Dogs are one of the few animals that will eat a corpse, and so they are just filthy animals as far as uh, Judaism is concerned, and that's the sense of it here. These filthy people, sorcerers, those that uh, are, are uh, into false religion, false contact with with false gods, fornicators, that is a, often an idolatry kind of a term, murderers, idolaters, people who lie about who they are to save their lives. All of those can be references to those who have defiled themselves with the emperor cult. Uh, he says in verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. And again, these terms are familiar to us from the beginning of the book where we heard them uh, first. He is the root of David, that is, the one that is the rightful heir to the throne of God, the reigning king. He is the morning star, that is, he is way high up, tall and exalted, above all other things. And this great one offers the invitation in verse 17, the spirit and the bride say, come, come. And let the one who hears say, come. There's an echo there, of course, of Isaiah 55. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. That's the refrain here as well. If you're thirsty, come. Take of the water of life. It is there to be had if you'll be faithful. The uh, book ends with John's warning I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues that are written in the book. If anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and the holy city, which are written in this book. Apocalypses in Jewish culture could be revised for new situations and audiences. Did John think that false prophets would tamper with the text? Uh, it's possible. There was some of that going around in the first century. In 2 Thessalonians, Paul makes an interesting statement in verse chapter 2, in verse 2. Do not be quickly shaken from your composure or disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if it were from us. Were people writing false things and saying Paul wrote this and John wrote this? Yeah. And so John has just said, listen, this is what I received. I have certified this. This is John, the apostle that you know. And if anybody tampers with this book, they are going to be in trouble with God because this is the way it is. Now, why would somebody want to tamper with the book? It's okay to worship the emperor. God didn't want you to kill yourself. Worship the emperor. Go ahead. Save your life. You know, no, that's not the message that came. And John says, nobody has the authority to change what has been written. God's word's always been like that. Deuteronomy 4, Moses said, You shall not add or take away from the word. Deuteronomy 12, Whatever I command you, do not add or take away from it. Uh, it's, it's the same here uh, as it is anywhere else in the word of God. He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming quickly. 
Those who say that the book of Revelation is about what's going on now seems to me you're going to have a problem with the word quickly. If quickly means 2,000 years later, I can't imagine what a long time in the Bible means. Um, he's going to do this within their experience. And so John closes with the standard New Testament closing, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Well, thank you for your good attention this evening, as always.